mysteries abound around the world. From strange lights in the night sky to ghostly apparitions passing from one realm to the next. From the great pyramids of Egypt to what lies beneath the depths of Loch Ness. From Bigfoot to Atlantis, they are all mysteries waiting to be solved. Join Lori Phillips, Lauren Smith, Graz, and Billy Simmons as they search for the truth on Nightcaller's Radio. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Nightcaller's Bigfoot Radio. It is April 7th, 2016. And we're all here tonight, me and Laura and Phil and Grant. You guys doing okay? We're doing Fantastic. <laughs> all Wonderful. Of that water, it's horrible. Oh. It's a beautiful name in the neighborhood. Everything's turning green from the pollen, I'll tell you something. That's true. Uh, my car is no, yellow my, from the pollen. My yeah. dogs are yellow. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're yellow. I don't know how they got yellow, but they're no. yellow. I thought they were brown for yellow. <laughs> well, did you guys hear about that gator eating, that gator, a uh, cow eating gator down in Florida? That they yeah. Caught? yeah so. Yeah. yeah. I can't even imagine it. Oh my gosh. Well, it was pretty big in the pictures, and I presume it was real, unless Brad can tell me different, because he always does that, like last week with the we Chupacabra. Yeah. We don't have that problem <laughs> up here, you see. We don't have that problem up here. <clears throat> well, he's got I'm gators here, that, but uh, nothing like that. I hope. <laughs> I'm staying on this side of the Rockies. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, those that don't know, Graz lives uh, in Seattle, Washington. Billy lives near Paris, Texas. I live near Tyler, Texas. And Lauren lives near Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we're just kind of diversified there. So... I'm the odd person. Anyway. I don't talk funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah we right. had to have a northerner on our show to appease everybody. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, we had to have a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Washington yeah. is considered Yankee or not. I mean, you know, granted, I'm a Hoosier by blood, but I don't consider Washington <laughs> to be Yankee. You can still call me a Yankee, I suppose, if you consider a Hoosier. A Yankee, which Billy, I think, does mostly anything north of the Thirty-six <laughs> matter. <laughs> I don't, they don't cotton on them Hoosiers either. <laughs> well, wanted to let everybody know before I forget that next Thursday, and I hate to do this to everyone out there, but we're not going to have a show because I'm going to be getting married. So. Yeah. You know, I thinking back on it, I'm pretty sure we had a show the week that I got married. Um, who's um, the boss here, right? Um, who is the boss? Um, <laughs> I actually think yeah, that back were... when we were doing it on Sundays, and I don't think we had a show that week, but I had to give yeah. you crap. I know, I know. You could have had a uh, show when Ricky proposed to you. That would have been interesting. Yeah. We could have. That would have been. Did you hear? We were already on. I thank title. God y'all didn't hear my answer when he proposed. What was because, it? Well, I mean, I said yes eventually, but I couldn't believe he was proposing at such a horrible time because I had had the worst <laughs> day, and then Mom calls this pop show meeting. Like all of a sudden, we have to have a show meeting right now. And he's leaned over me with a ring asking me to marry him. And I'm like, are you really doing this right now? That mm-hmm. was my answer. Well, it was set up so we could all be in the same room. Exactly. We That's were in right. I remember that. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Terrible. He, he set that up a couple of days ahead of time with all of us. Oh, I know. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. I screwed that up. Anyway, I said yes. Yeah. That was bloody. Well, he wanted to make sure with all those people around, you wouldn't say no. See, That's you true. know, embarrassing. Yeah. See, so so you had to say yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we've been happily married for almost four years, five years, four years. Congratulations. So. Yeah, it's going to be four years, isn't it? Mm-hmm. No. Yep. Okay. Yeah. No, five years. Five, five years. Five years. Wow. Yep. God, I can't even remember. That's bad. Anyway. <laughs> that happens when you have children. You just forget That's your true. name. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I y'all, you ready for had a lobotomy at the same time? So exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it only gets better from here. Well, you know, Bill, I'm not gonna really take a page out of your book. I'm just going to go ahead and stop now. Yeah. Two is good. Come on. I don't need a whole slew of them. Oh, you don't need tribe? Nope. I got my own hockey team. What are you saying? <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Yeah. I don't know either. Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. Anyway. <laughs> Well, I'm ready for a guest. How about y'all? Sure. Yep, let's do it. Okay. All right. It's good to hear all of y'all, though. I haven't got to hear y'all since about 30 minutes ago. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! What was that? All right, ladies and gentlemen. Bigfoot Radio presents... Keith Bearden of Georgia, and I'm hoping I didn't step on his name because there's different pronunciations, and I forgot to ask him what it was, but Keith Bearden is what I'm going to go with. He's a resident of Dallas, Georgia. He's lived there in that area all his life. Growing up, he heard stories of Bigfoot and Sasquatch, and like many others, he has seen the Patterson Gilm, Gim 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 film on TV when he was a youngster. All of these events sparked a kind of curiosity of the possibility of them being real, and it laid tucked away in his mind. And like so many, he figured if they truly existed, it would be in the Pacific Northwest. Yay! Wrong. (laughs) Fast forward. (laughs) I've only seen one. Fast forwarding uh, (laughs) to a few years later, Strange and weird things began to happen on his family's hunting property. Trees bent over into arches overnight, twisted branches, odd sounds, and screams during the night. Events progressed into visual sightings by himself, his wife, and others. Keith has been blessed to have help understanding what was happening by a great many good folk. He now has regular interactions, visual sightings, and has been fortunate to share them with others. Keith has taken these experiences and written a book called Forest Friends of the Night. He hopes to help others with his experiences and his journey into the realm of Bigfoot. And we've got some websites here that maybe uh, Lauren can put into the room. Yeah. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you, Grant, for that wonderful introduction. And Mm -hmm. Keith, welcome to Bigfoot. Night Caller Speaks of Radio. Boy, I'm going to be tongue-tied today. Hello. How are you? I'm great. How are you? That was really good, Graz. You did a good job. He did. Hey, and not many <laughs> people get my name correct the first time. I don't know why it looks difficult. but it Yeah, I know. There's, there's two or three different pronunciations of it. That's why I just said, I just went with what I know. <laughs> you did good. Thank you. That's good. I was thinking he said it right. You know, but it looks like it could be bear den. I yep, guess you hear that. It does. Yep. <laughs> of course, it depends on if you're from Texas or Georgia, too, because you all talk funny down there anyway. Yeah, you know, my area. <laughs> I've been working on my accent for going on 54 years, and I've just about got it perfect. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, Keith, you know, uh, he he told us uh, when he was reading the bio that you grew up hearing about stories about Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Could you share some of those stories with us that you heard as you were growing up? Of course, 
I, you know, just like everyone else, the first few times I heard about it was on TV uh, in search of uh, Leonard Nimoy's, uh, in search of Bigfoot, uh, things there. And then the Patterson Gimlin film that I'd seen off and on and thought, wow, those are those are really neat, especially the Patterson Gimlin film. I was in, you know, just total um, awe of, of what I was seeing on TV. And I, you know, up until this day, to me, that's just the best there is. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Growing, yeah, and growing up, um, you know, in Georgia, there's there's not much, you know, worry or even discussion about them being around here. Um, but I grew up uh, hunting and fishing, being outside all my life, um, and we uh, we had a we had rabbit dogs when I was growing up, so we did a lot of rabbit hunting, and we used to frequent uh, areas down near the Chattahoochee River here in Northwest Georgia, and down there, there was a couple older folks that lived in the area, and they would come out, and, and we would, you know, run our rabbit dogs together, and they used to always talk about uh, Bigfoot in and around that area, and that uh, time to time, they run across them. Of course, I thought, being a kid, they were saying that just to kind of scare me and, and that, so I, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it, but they seemed very sincere in, in talking about it, but Again, something I just thought, well, you know, they're just telling me those things, you know, because I'm, cause I'm a kid. So I pretty much put that away, and I never did run across anything back then, but, you know, just the occasional story and uh, that I heard, heard on TV. But, boy, I was wrong, and I found that out many years afterwards. Um, so wh- when was it that you found out? How how many years was that? Was that within the last ten years or yeah, soon yeah. longer? Than uh, right. Well, I'll go back a little bit. Um, okay. I'd say back back in the uh, back in around two thousand and five to two thousand and ten on our hunting property, and this is in more of west central Georgia. Um, we had odd things that would happen. We would. We would hear odd screams at night, and you know I knew the animals pretty good. My my family, we all hunted it, and we knew the area, we knew the woods, we knew the layout, and you know we were very familiar with it. Uh, we heard screams uh, a few times at night that was not bobcats. They uh, a couple of them, the way I described them, sounded like a cow having a baby, uh, just real deep, low, and then it would get higher and higher, and it would it would peak into a very shrill scream at the top of the register that, you know, it was just amazing the the, the loud uh, scream that would that would follow follow that up. Uh, and we heard it several different times, and of course we're all kind of well, maybe that's a, maybe that's a panther from from Florida because we'd heard tales of some of them, you know, coming up in in Georgia, but again, nothing that would make us think. Uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Uh, it's just one of those things that you hear at night, you try to push it back to the back of your mind and not think about it, especially as right. a, a young man. And I had a, a son that was that was hunting with me too at the time. He was he was pretty young, so um, so that's kind of how it started. Uh, and then fast forward a couple of years past that point. We started noticing, and I'd say this is around the 2008-2009, we started noticing odd things around the, the woods where we hunted. Uh, I was walking down a road not too far from the camper and noticed a tree that I had passed. Now, this was during the afternoon. I had passed that same tree the day before. It was perfectly straight. Um, it was bent all the way over and, and broken in two. And this tree was about six inches in diameter. And it was broke about six foot high. And I'm thinking to myself, now, how could that happen? The weather was perfect. There was no storms. There was nothing like that. I know that it wasn't a deer that did that. Um, so with that, I was, you know, one of those odd things. Now, how could that happen? So, you know, we only have a few people that hunted with us, uh, mostly family. Of course, I question everybody. Did you guys, anybody been that tree, or how did that happen? Nobody, mm-hmm. of course, knew. And the way you got into our property, it's gated at the main road, and we're about a mile, mile and a half off the main road. Um, and you have to go through another camp at the front of the uh, front of the gate, 
when you when you go through it before you even get the hours, and there's no way in from the other end. Uh, there's no way to get in there. So we had never seen anyone or had any problems with anybody coming onto our property. So I knew it wasn't uh, done by anyone that was with us. So, again, uh, we started seeing things like that, and that multiplied. We were seeing these things uh, from that year. We started seeing them quite often. And it, um, what really, really got me was one day I was doing a walk not too far from that particular location, uh, coming down a logging road, and noticed a, a tree that was probably 50, 60 foot high. And that was, uh, it was bent all the way over, touching the ground. And I'm like, well, how in the world? So I walked over, and there was a dead tree that was uh, that was on top of it, so it was pinned down. Oh, uh, wow, but, that's great. Of course, yeah. When I saw that, I knew there was something. And, you know, reaching back, I started thinking, well, maybe there's, you know, something to this. So I started researching uh, bent trees and animals that could do that on the Internet. And, of course, I ran across the Bigfoot stuff, uh, bent trees, arches, whatever. I started reading about it. And, of course, I'm like, well, there's no way. They're, they're not in Georgia. They're up parts northwest. They're, you know, I've heard the patterson Gimlin film out there. And, Above Creek, but you know that can't be what it is. But the more I read and the more I, I I saw, the more I started thinking. Well, is it possible that they're real and they're here? Um, so you know, in the next year or two, I kind of put that away and and try not to think about it um, until one night my son and I had gotten into camp late. We were actually going to do some turkey hunting. It was in springtime. We were going to do some turkey hunting the following day. And he put a new laser sight on the shotgun. So we decided, or he decided, he wanted to get out there and shoot that gun, make sure his sight was in. So he did. Uh, in right. the headlights of the truck, about 1130 at night, it was very, very calm, clear night. And uh, so we shot the gun and put the gun away after we had it sighted in. And the woods really came to life after that. It was like crazy wild with screens uh, just like the ones I described but they were they were in front of us they were behind us they were like on all sides they were just screaming back and forth and he and I both looked at each other and you know it was pretty pretty wild and pretty scary at the same time mm-hmm. so now I'm really starting to get um, get a little concerned and worried that whatever these things are aren't friendly um, so with that we ended up going to bed that night and you know me as a grown man not afraid too much and I've been in those woods all my life at dark and never had had that much fear I uh, actually uh I chained up the uh, door to the camper that night I was really concerned um <laughs> that's that's I mean because it was it was unreal yeah. the, the sounds these things make yeah, but still I'm not I'm not giving in to the fact that it's a Bigfoot I'm, I'm not thinking that yet I'm thinking maybe there's possibility but I still want to see I've got to see it to believe it. I got to see more than just that. So come. Uh, but whatever that, it was, it 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 brought it it made you fearful. And it made me fearful, and the the sound uh, was like it reverberated in my in my body. It was just so loud. Oh gosh! Uh, and there were several. There were several of them back and forth. So you know, it sounded like to me they were communicating, uh, you know, to each other because one would yell and then I'd hear one further off in the distance yell back and then would kind of go back and forth and from what I heard there was at least three separate individuals that was making the, making the screams so after that weekend I go back and I look on the internet and I start reading about the screams and I run across Ron Moorhead Sierra Sounds um, didn't hear that I didn't hear the, the sounds exactly like what he had but I did run across the Ohio howl uh, and oh, yeah. a couple others that was very, very close to what I heard. And I can't remember exactly which one it was, but there was one that was almost spot on to what we heard. So now I'm about 80% sure that there's something like that on our property, but I just I don't know for sure yet. So the mm-hmm. next day uh, we decided instead of – we did a, a quick turkey hunt in the morning, but my son and I decided we were going to try to – find out what's going on on our property that was in the in my mind first and foremost and i was kind of concerned 
So what we did was we started out, uh, there's a creek that goes right through the middle of our property, and I thought the easier walking would be on that creek. And we could kind of look for signs or tracks or something like that along that creek. So that's what we did. We uh, we started walking the creek from one end of the property. We got uh, we got about halfway through, and we started noticing um, feces, uh, big, very big around feces on some of the rocks in the creek. And I knew what what coon looked like. I knew what possum looked like. There was really nothing else that I could think would would do that. So again, we we took some photos of those, and you know I've got them. Got them still here, uh, and I, you know, still trying to figure if that's what it is or not. And we also noticed some of the rocks were wet. Uh, this is a very, uh, it's not a very aggressive creek. It's kind of a slow run. It's not uh, splashing the rocks, so they shouldn't have been wet unless something stepped on those rocks. But again, it could have been anything. It could have been a coon. It could have been whatever. Uh, so we've made our way two thirds of the way along that creek through the center of our property. And there was a sandbar, and on that sandbar, there was a track of some sort. It was a big track. Um, I, when I first looked, it kind of looked like bear, but we have no bear there. We've, we've never seen a bear on the property. We've never even heard of bears being in that county. Most of the bears were, were further north, in north, north Georgia. So looking at the track, when I got a little closer to it, it wasn't a bear track. It was a bear foot with toes and everything. And when I seen that, my stomach did a, did a, a, a turnover. I mean, I was like, oh, my God. That track changed my entire life from that point because it was what I'd seen on the Internet. It was a, wow. it was a track that looked like the same one that I'd, I'd seen that people called Bigfoot. So I called my son over. We took photos of it. I did some video of it. And it was extremely fresh. This track was, was so fresh that it looked like it had just uh, been in front of us. Um, so, again, that that was when everything kind of changed for me, and that's when I started looking into everything I could. And, and hunting and going down there uh, totally changed in my mind, not as much uh, going down there and having fun with my family, but i got to figure out more about this. So... After that, I did some more research. I found the BFRO um, online, and I gave them a call. Um, and I had a call back a few days later. A lady that was um, in the area, uh, was in the Columbus area. She was actually worked for the uh, United States Army, but she was a, um, a field um, person for the BFRO, contacted me, and she... Uh, met with my son and I at a Waffle House there in Columbus. And so we told her what we had going on and what I saw and what he saw and, you know, the, the screams and that. So she uh, she made a, a trip down to our property a few days after that. And uh, mm-hmm. we went and looked around, and she started pointing out uh, some teepee-type uh, structures that we found on the property that she explained to me that were made by them. And I had seen them. Um, don't know why I didn't put two and two together. I guess I'm just not, you know, I'm not versed on what to look for. Um, so um, she began to kind of show us what we were, uh, what we were seeing, uh, it was, and, and showed us in books, and gave me links to look up. And I joined the forum and started asking questions. But that's kind of how it started. Um, and it, I don't know how much more you want to hear before we get into the real good stuff. But that's that's how okay. it all started. I just have a couple of questions before okay. you get into the good stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you found the trees broke over, were they broke over a trail? Um, the one that had the 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 bowed, uh one that was pinned to the ground, it was directly over a trail. Um, okay. In other words, you could walk under that tree, and and it was been over high enough at where the base was that you could walk underneath it and not touch where it was been over. Then you walk down a little ways, and and uh, and that was really, and that trail was a really really good um, a deer trail that moved in and out of the out of the woods up uh, a ridge line. Now down on the creek where we found the track and a teepee structure, there was a, a very very good deer trail that was always used. Uh, it was one of my favorite places to actually go hunt 
uh, was in between two large hills. There was a hill on one side, a hill on the other, and this was down at the bottom, and there was a creek that ran alongside the one that we found the track in. So it was a natural funnel area. So there was a lot of movement in and out there, and the, the leaves stayed wore, wore out to the, to the dirt. Um, and incidentally, uh, the TP structure that we found, um, after I started going back down there and looking at what she showed me, started finding deer hair around that teepee structure um, in great big uh, handfuls. It looked like it had been pulled out of the deer or they'd gotten in a fight or uh, maybe uh-huh. one was killed. Or, we started seeing that, and, and I took photos of that too. You know, we we started seeing quite a bit of that, which leads to That's even a better better thing that happened a little later and I'll get into that too but that's yeah, that's where all the uh, structures we've seen okay and then when you found the track it, and and you said that it was fresh you felt it was fresh did it occur to you that you might have been watched while you were looking at that track it ran through my mind yes ma'am um, <laughs> the, the track was so fresh and part of the thing if if you're walking on the beach and you're where the tide comes in and, and rolls out, you know, you can kind of, your foot kind of gets buried in the sand. You pick your foot up and it fills in real quick with the water. But, you know, some of the sand gets stuck on your foot and it kind of drips off your foot in a big clump of dirt or a, a big clump of sand with, with that. Well, that was what this was. It You could tell that it had sunk down in the, the dirt a little bit, but there was a big clump that was there in front of it, and it had just came off, and it, it was real fresh. It had to be within, you know, a very short time that that, that happened. Um, and I will admit, when we seen that, I was ready to go. I was ready to I'm back up, go back up the trail and, and leave that area because, you know, it spooked me. And it spooked me more because I was a father, I think, and had a kid there. Uh, even though he was 15 at the time, he was a big kid. It's still kind of scary having your, your son down there and not knowing these things are dangerous or not. You know, I was pretty right. sure what I was looking at is what I'd seen online and there's some pretty awful looking pictures of, of what I saw uh, that people had betrayed them to be but uh, Brad, did you have any questions before you moved on? No, no, no not at this oh. moment no. Okay. Um, I'm just enjoying his stories. Yes. I love the way he tells it. It's uh, absolutely if your book is as good as your uh, relating of the story now, I think it's going to be a very good book. Well, the book follows um, it follows the timeline, and the thing about it is, when it, when all this started, um, my natural tendency uh, doing the, the the job that I had when I was working uh, the steel company was I had to gather evidence and I had to write things down and keep journals of different problems, and then I had to do root cause analysis to determine what what was going on and it's kind of like what I was doing here. I was taking notes. I was gathering as much evidence as I could, and I was writing everything in a journal and dating it. Even with the weather, uh, I was putting all of it in there so I could capture as much information as I could. So when I went back to write the book, it was pretty simple because I had most everything in a journal. Um, so that, that really helped. And now, how long ago yeah, was it when you first started investigating that was that was around 2009, 2010. So it hasn't been that many years ago that I came from there to where I'm at now. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take long if you're in a good spot. It really <laughs> doesn't. It's a fast education, isn't it? <laughs> well, um, I don't call myself a researcher or such. I just experienced what I've experienced. Yeah. And I think I think that's what eventually happens is a lot of people start out as researchers and then become more interested in just the the interaction, the experience. Right. Because that's what you do it all for anyway. At first yeah, I've always said there's an evolution of the Bigfoot researcher. They start out researching to prove it to themselves. And then when they prove it to themselves, then they're trying to then they go through a spell where they can prove it to everybody else so they don't look crazy. And then when they can't do that, then they become an experiencer. Right. And it, it kind of it kind of goes that way. And then uh, so 
uh, I think you probably were a researcher at one time, didn't even realize it. But well, anyway, I was uh, definitely researching for myself, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, things changed, though. You know, uh, when did you really actually start becoming an experiencer, and, and what happened? Okay. To, well, shortly after the track that we found and uh, we had the, uh, the the lady that worked for the BFRO came down and showed us some things, and um, she had night vision goggles and that. She actually came and spent the day with us and part of an evening, one evening. Of course, the night she was there, nothing. We heard no sounds. We heard no screaming. We heard nothing. Um, but we did take the night vision goggles, and my son did a little walk with her through the woods at night. Of course, she didn't see anything. Um, so after that, um, the very next year, my mom and dad, um, we had a camper that we had pulled down, a small one, uh, to get ready for the, the next upcoming season. We'd take the campers home every year. So we had taken the campers home after turkey season and brought them back before the next deer season started. So they, they brought one small one back, and there was a big one that um, I normally pulled it for them um, with, with this truck. And I wasn't there. I was actually in Texas uh, for my company and doing some work there. So they pulled the camper down one night, and they decided to sleep in the truck and let my son stay in the smaller camper because it, it doesn't have a lot of room in it. So uh, my mom and dad, they uh, made their beds. They had the camper shell on the back of the truck. So they uh, they crawled back there and, and went to sleep. My mom likes to sit up and read, so she had a little flashlight reading the book, and they had a little dog with them. So she's reading the book, and my dad, he's over on the other side snoring like he does. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, my mom felt the truck move. And she thought, well, he turned over, but he hadn't moved. So she's like, what What caused that? Then all of a sudden, the truck started shaking. It shook oh. to the point to where my mom got pretty excited and woke him up, and he sat up, and uh, and it stopped. And he's looking around, wanting to know what was going on. She said, well, the truck was shaking. Something's shaking the truck. And he's like, well, maybe it was a maybe it was a deer. Maybe it was this or that, you know. Nobody ever thought of, you know, Bigfoot or whatever. Oh, no. But my mom had remembered me talking about finding the tracks. So they were kind of alerted a bit, you know, to what, what went on. Uh, so she sat up for pretty much for the rest of the night and finally fell asleep early morning um, before it got daylight because she was kind of afraid of, of what was out there. My dad didn't bother him. He went right back to sleep and didn't wake up till the, till the next day. But So they called me the next day to tell me about what happened. Um, they got out. They looked around the truck, didn't find any tracks, didn't find anything that they associate with what, with what happened to the truck and why it started shaking. So, um, again, that gets filed as another event that, that took place. Um, and as they're telling me, I'm already, you know, researching and I'm pretty much convinced I knew what it was that did it. So um, that was that was the real start of a lot of interaction around camp. Um, and then that progressed into uh, hunters would come in. And then after the season got started, uh, we had a couple that came in and had heard uh, what he said sounded like a gorilla. He said it sounds just like what you would hear a gorilla in a zoo making these, you know, noises and beating his chest. And, and he's like, ah. I don't know what it was, but it sure scared me. And you know, there were several of them that heard those noises. Um, so again, um, I'm writing it all down in my journal and keeping it. I never heard it. My son heard it. My dad heard it. Um, our little niece, when she was eight years old at the time, was with him, and she had heard it. Um, and then not too long after that, my brother saw something moving through the woods, um, black. Um, he thought at first it was like somebody's black dog he got out, but as he kept watching it, it wasn't a dog because it was moving, and there was more vertical black than there was horizontal black, if that makes any sense. Uh-huh. As it was. Yeah. He he never saw legs, arms. He just seen the movement going through the trees. So, um, again... We don't know exactly if that was one or not, but I felt like it may have been um, based on how he described it to me. 
So, you know, things keep kind of building at this point. Uh, it got to, to one point that every single time that we would sit by the fire at night, we would hear uh, walking. The walking would encircle our camp. Um, it started at one point. It would move all the way around out of the firelight. You couldn't see anything, but you could hear, and they were always bipedal footsteps. Uh, wow. And so... When all of this started happening, um, we got to the point that we, we would only do a fire, make a fire when it was more than one person because we still don't know what's going to happen. I'm still a little bit afraid of what's going on. Um, and then we would hear other strange sounds. Now, they say Bigfoots can mimic. And I can tell you what we heard one night. My My father and my uncle had heard it first a couple weeks prior to that. But they heard a horse whinny. You know, a horse makes uh-huh. the, the whinny sound that, that he does. And they thought immediately that somebody's horse had got out and was on our property. Well, this horse came in close to the fire, and he was walking around the outside of the firelight in the woods. And you could hear it breaking sticks, and it kept circling to the point to where my dad and, and his brother grabbed flashlights and a couple guns and they were going to walk down and see if they could see this horse cross one of the many roads that were around our camp. So the horse would get right up to the edge of the road and start crossing it would turn and go back the other way. So they never did see what it, what it was that was making this noise and they never seen any horse prints anywhere. They heard this and then it happened two or three different times while we were down there. So I don't know if I still can't say that was Bigfoot. It could have been a horse, but it was just odd. Yeah. So that was running through my mind, too. I was reading about, you know, uh, and it's being new to this thing and having all this new stuff happen, and it's like I'd research and I'd put it in the Internet and I'd uh, put in sounds, and I would find things that were almost identical that other people had experienced. So, you know, it was pretty uh, pretty wild. And, and this kept going on. And finally, you know, through Facebook, I started connecting with a few of the people that I had read, uh, you know, stories from and that. And uh, one of the persons or one of the people that I had friended was Melba Ketchum. And she had been working on, this is a few years later, she had been working on the study that, that she was working on. And, and this was way before the study came out uh, when, she, when she got it finished. But Melba... Um, was a lot of help explaining some things to me, and I had a lot of questions. The only one that I knew that since she said she was a doctor, I was thinking, well, I could at least ask her questions and she's going to shoot me straight. Um, she told me of a lady in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. if I wanted to get more information, she said, look, I'm going to give, the na- give you the name of this lady, and she's the real deal. She said, I'm telling you, I was with her when I seen my first one. And she's the real deal. She can help you understand more of what you have going on. And she introduced me to Arla Williams. Um, mm-hmm. When she introduced me to Arla Williams, um, I had finally someone that I could talk to, and she would explain things back the way I could understand. And so I started conversing with Arla. Um, I also um, was on. A, I jumped on another forum. Uh, Oregon Bigfoot, and was talking to uh, some people there, and Autumn Williams was giving me some advice, and she called me one day, and we talked for over two hours, and she shared a lot of really cool stuff with me, too. So, you know, I started building a a network of people that I trusted to give me the right information, because what I found out earlier on, there were some real jerks online that would make fun of you and laugh at you, and call you everything in the book and then there were some people that would actually try to help you understand and you know i wasn't saying that i was this or that i just wanted answers um and it got to the point on the on the bfro forum i kept asking for answers and asking for answers and they got tired of me asking for answers so i ended up getting kicked off of there because they said that's not what the forum is about so i said okay that's fine but mm-hmm. I had, like i said i had started building a network of friends that later on really changed the way I looked at everything and brought me full circle to understanding what these people are. So um, that was the start, 
and things got better and better after after that. Um, now I don't know if you want me to keep on going. This is kind of full of well, with my book, or you can ask questions at any time. What? Um, you hear me, all right? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> I may have missed it. Uh, did you say you have? Have you seen one yourself yet? I have. Not at the point that we're at in the story, but. Yes, I have seen I have seen more than one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I'll uh, I'll try to speed through and we'll get to that part part of the story if you want. Um, oh no, that just just take your time and okay. Yeah. Well, I won't, oh, I don't want to forget any details that you know that there's some pretty cool things that's happening now in the story and they get better and better and better into. Uh, one of the best uh, visual confirmations that anyone could ever have a face-to-face with one standing on the trail 30 feet away, and I had multiple witnesses with me. So we'll get to that, and that was a life-changing okay. event as well. That's uh, That just happened last year. So um, now where I am now with, with our property, we had some things that were going on in the property with, with Bigfoot sightings and that, and we had some some issues with with some family members. Um, I was a little reluctant to even stay down there because I'm afraid of these things at this point. You know, I'm hearing from others that they're not dangerous, but I don't want a chance it with with my son. So first one thing or another, we we ended up leaving that property. I left the property and left it with my kinfolk that that had the property, and we left and went uh, to another tract of land that was – um, about an hour closer. It was about a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour drive from my house there. So we went to another track of land that was about half that distance. It was easier to get to. It had electricity and that with the plug campers down there, and it was a lot more comfortable. So we ended up moving there. I felt so much better that I wasn't in the woods with these creatures or, or Bigfoot. <laughs> so, I'm know, laughing I'm, because I know where yeah. this story is going. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the first year was great. Um had a good time down there, and then all of a sudden, uh, Laura, yep, I started seeing these trees bent over again, and I started seeing, you know, the same things that I saw down there, and then exactly the same, uh, almost identical tree bent all the way over with a dead tree pulled over on top of it, pinned to the ground. So I'm thinking, they're here now. (laughs) I've got the same things here, but I had kind of progressed through the point, and I had been talking to Arla, who had really shared a lot of information, uh, and she'd been around them since she was six years old. And she, you know, she shared so much that helped me ease my mind to the point that I'd gotten past the fear part, and I was more in a part that I wanted to, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to even see one. I wanted, I wanted more out of what I was. I mean, I'm really, really eager now to, to get a little further in, into this thing. So um, it was kind of a bad part of my life. But during all that, back of the other property, I went through a really nasty divorce, uh, got out of a bad relationship. I, uh, I got with a girl that I had went to school with after that. I, we met up and started dating, and we actually ended up getting married uh, about two years after that. So I've got this new lady in my life, Kathy, my wife. Now, uh, when we were actually down there camping, in the, in the new area, the uh, land that's it's actually in Heard County, Georgia, I can tell you the location, close to the Chattahoochee River, um, we were laying there camping uh, in a camper one night, just talking, and all of a sudden I hear a noise outside. Uh, something fell. It was a still night, very, very quiet. You could hear everything. And I heard the exact same chatter sounds that I had heard in the Sierra sounds, the samurai-type chatter. I could hear it outside, and that chatter was loud enough to where Kathy could hear it too, and I said, they're here. They're here on the property, and I knew from that point that they were here, but I didn't have the fear that I had before. Uh, When I heard it, Kathy, she didn't know what to think. (laughs) She said, that's what that is, Um, but now Kathy also believed in the Bigfoot. She's Got a lot of Native American in her, and they did. You know, she, her sister, went to powwows. They heard the stories around the campfire, so they had always believed them anyway. Um, so, 
she wasn't one to shoot me down when I started talking about it. She was very interested and wanted to learn more and learn more. And as things are progressing, and I'm reporting back to Arlo Williams and Tom Cantrell was in, in the mix and helping me understand some things among many others. Um, Arlo told me, she says, you know, they're not to be feared. They're, they're forest people, just like, uh, you know, like we're people. They're like us in a lot of ways, and a lot of ways they're not like us. But don't go out with fear. Go out with respect and just respect them when you're in the woods. So I started kind of doing exactly what she said. I would go out. I try not to be fearful. Of course, I was still a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I would actually, and I felt, I did, I felt foolish at first because I'd go out and talk to the woods. I'd go out and say, hey, you know, I'm your friend. I'm coming in respect. If if you guys could show yourselves to me, and, of course, nothing would happen. I would talk to the woods. I wouldn't have anything happen at that point. But little bitty things started happening to the point to where I started getting my confirmation on almost a weekly basis. For example, um, I had a trail that I would go down with my four-wheeler down to a section of our property. So one morning I fired the four-wheeler up. I'm going down the trail, and there's a tree pulled across the trail. Or actually at that time I thought it fell across the trail. The only thing that was weird about it was I was in a pine forest. There was no hardwoods at all. This was timber company land, and they had cleared all the hardwoods out. It was only pines. But it was a hardwood tree. It was about as big around as, as my leg. Um, I could pull it. It took a little effort. I could pull it out of the way, and I did. So I pulled it out of the way one day, and I swear I thought I heard somebody laughing at me. I heard an audible. Oh it sounded like a laugh. So I'm like, okay. So I go on my way. I come back, and that same tree is back across the trail. Get off wow. the four-wheeler. <laughs> I pull it out of the way again. And, again, I thought I heard a laugh, you know. May have been my imagination, but I swear that's what I heard. So finally, you know, I go back to the about it. Um, I called my dad. He was at home. I told him about it. We were just going over some things, and I was telling him about all the weird things that was going on. And um, so the next day, I go back over there, and there tr- a tree is back across the trail. So I took the tree, hooked it to my foyer, and I pulled it two or 300 yards down the road over off in the bushes and through it. And I told him, I said, quit pulling the tree across the trail. That's causing a lot of noise. I'm trying to get in here and hunt. So that was all good. I didn't see the tree no more when I came out, so I thought I'd I'd won the the battle. So we go, and we were leaving to go home that afternoon. We packed ourselves and went home. Well, my son came down right after we left, and he camped. Well, the day, the next morning that he was going down the trail, and I didn't even tell him about it, he called me up that afternoon and said, hey, do you know, I was down there hunting that trail, and there was a tree across it. And I said, really? Yeah, they had brought that same tree back up there. It was back across the trail. In the so, same spot? Same exact spot. Same wow. exact spot. So Now, that and, is hard to dispute right there. There's something <laughs> going on there. <laughs> there. There was something going on. I knew there was something going on. But, you know, I wasn't afraid anymore. I was actually kind of laughing about it all because I could feel they were playing a trick on me. And that actually gave me a lot of relief because it was a it was an interaction and it was a, a well thought out interaction. There was, you know, some some smarts behind this thing. So it was like, Oh, okay and that actually did. It really made me feel better about everything. So we uh, we started doing a a lot of camping, um and campfires and and going down there, even when it wasn't deer season, we'd go down there and we'd just camp out. And we would hear tree knocks. Um, we started seeing the, the bent over trees along trails coming up to our campsite. Um, and then there was, we went down one evening and there was a tree that had been pushed over by the roots. And it was there where our camp was. But you could walk behind that tree and you could see the camp perfect, but you couldn't see through the tree. So I felt like that was a place that they were coming up watching. Like they had set up a blind. Right. So we had taken Kathy's grandson, uh, Lane, we had taken him with us down there. And and Arlan said, you want to, you know, just have fun, go down there and, you know, take your grandkids and y'all just do what you do. The the Bigfoot, if they want you to know they're there, they'll let you know. So we did. We took took him down. We had watermelon one night and we 
took the rinds out and set them out on a tree stump and, you know, had, had some watermelon left on them, and we're trying to gift them, you know, like I had read other people doing. Of course, I'm new to this thing. I'm still not knowing what to expect or anything else. Well, one evening after we did the, the gifting of the watermelon rinds, I went back over to see if the rinds were still there, and one was there, one was, was eaten, but the other one was gone, and there was a rock on the stump with a blue jay feather up underneath the rock. Wow. And I'm thinking, now that's cool. That feather uh-huh. just make it on that stump with a rock on top of it. So that was a signal to me that this is something that's going to turn into something really special if I do it the right way. Um, from that point on, I looked at them as intelligent beings. I didn't look at them as monsters or creatures or anything else. So my whole perception is starting to change and to the point that we would go down there and I started doing a little bit of that. I'd, I'd leave something out. I wouldn't leave food out because I was told don't, don't do that. It could be something that they get used to, you know, they kind of learn to expect it. But you know, we would leave little trinkets here and there. And I didn't get the feathers all the time. As a matter of fact, it would be several times before I would get anything that would happen. But every so often, I would have something like that. So fast forward to my wife's fighting. This is what sealed the deal and sent me on my journey into where I'm at now. Um not too long after the watermelon deal, we had laying down again, and I had went out turkey hunting the evening before. Um, I was sitting on a field um, and had my decoys out, and I was in a blind, and I started hearing this whistling sound. It was it was a strange bird whistle that I'd never heard in the forest before. It was so strange that um, that I kept looking for the source, and the turkey hunting was more worried about this whistling that I kept hearing, and it was it was really getting on my nerves to the point to where I stood up, I took the decoys, put them back in the bag, and I go walking toward this whistling because it's going on and on and on. So I get to where the location I think the whistling's coming from, expect to see some sort of bird. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. It just stopped. So I said, okay. Well, maybe it flew away. So I set my decoys back up, looking the other direction. I set my bond back up. I got in it and got comfortable, and the whistling started again behind me. So I'm like, okay, now this is irritating. So I get up, I walk toward the whistling, and it continues. I get to the point where I think I'm going to be able to see it, and it stops. So I walk up to where I think it is, and right on top of the hill beside the road bed that runs through the forest, there is this rock stack. Uh, the rock on the bottom had to be 50, 60 pounds, huge rock on the bottom. And then it continued up with a smaller rock on it, a smaller rock on it, and it had several rocks stacked up in a nice, neat little stack. So I'm like, well, they wanted me to come find this rock stack. So, again, I took photos of it. I put it online. I sent it to all my friends and showed them what we found. And, you know, I thought it was pretty cool. So um, I went and got my, my wife, and Lane brought them down there. We took some pictures of Lane beside the rock stack and heard from the rock stack and went back to camp. Now, I'm thinking, this is just the coolest thing ever. You know, I've got real interaction going with them. Of course, I still haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. So, the next, the, we went to bed, we grilled out burgers, went to bed. The next morning, um, Amanda, uh, Kathy's daughter, Amanda, lives not too far from our camp. She's going to come pick Lane up and take him home, and we're going to pack up and go back to our house. And Amanda pulls up, and she's standing there with Lane at the car, and we're in front of the camper. Kathy's looking kind of toward the woods. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'm standing there with my back to the woods beside Amanda and Lane, and we're talking sentence, and I could tell she was watching something over my shoulder. And I said, Kathy? She says, hold on a minute. I said, are you okay? She didn't say anything. I said, are you okay? She didn't say anything, but she wouldn't. she wouldn't point. She never would tell me what was going on, so I'm kind of at a loss what's what's happening here. I could tell that something had interrupted her train of thought. So she told Amanda that she needed to go. She had to go to the restroom. So Amanda said, okay, bye. She could, you know, give her kisses, and we close the door. They drive off, and she grabs me by the arm and pulls me into the camera. She says, you're not going to believe what I just saw. I said, what did you just see? I mean, what happened? And I'm kind of concerned here, you know. 
She said, I saw a Bigfoot. I said, you did what? She said, behind you. He was standing there with that tree pulled over, and he looked around the tree and looked right at me. And I said, what did he look like? She said, he was a dark color, didn't have a lot of hair on his face, but she said he had a beard, it came down, um, had a nose that was a little bit pointed but flat on the end, and she gave a real, real good description. She said, he looked at me with his eyes and smiled. And he, he smiled at you. She said, yes. And so you weren't afraid? She said, no. It just looked like a big, tall, hairy man. And I'm like, wow. wow. So we walk over, and I found some tracks. I found where he was at and how he had left to go. I could, I, It was very, very easy to see the tracks. I took photos of that. I went and wrote it all down in my journal, and I couldn't get to the phone fast enough to call somebody to tell them about it. And of course, mm-hmm. she's excited, and I'm excited, and it was just it was an awesome moment. And we weren't afraid at all. And she was beside herself with, with joy of what she saw. And that was the first visual that we had or that she had. And I still haven't had a, a good face, facial visual to this point. But she yeah. did. So that was, <laughs> that was um, the first one. And the interactions at that place um, kept up to the point to where I had called Arla. Um, to tell her about all this we're going over she, and she says I've got to come to Georgia she said I want to come to Georgia and, and see what you're talking about I want to experience it so we had decided that we were going to um, try to find a place and have a camp out so that's kind of started um, what we do now we've been doing now every year since three years ago is we have um, we have camp outs in Georgia Arla comes and I invite people. We put them in a group. I invite people. She invites people, and we uh, we we start uh, you know trying to get like minds together, camp, have fun, and see what happens. And that's that has become one of the most awesome events that I can that I can even talk about. I'll, I'll I'll go through some of that too. So now it's up to us to find a place for the camp out. I couldn't bring them to that campsite. Because it was, you know, hunting property, and you know, the leases had to have insurance to be on the property and that sort of thing. But I had to find somewhere close. Yep. So, I um, I looked at the map. I started doing a little bit of research, and at this point in time, I'm looking a lot into the Native American aspects of the Bigfoot. And you know, my research has brought me in a lot of different places. You know, went down a few rabbit holes and back out of the rabbit holes. Uh, and then uh-huh. talking to people, um, there was a lot of things that were people were telling me that I found very hard to believe. Um, all I could go by was what I've experienced and what I knew to happen to be true. Um, and some of the people that I was talking that I was talking to, Arlen and a few others, uh, had never told me a lie, and I believed what they told me. They started telling me about things that they could do, and that uh, kind of blew me away. But Again, I, I wait and I experience it. I believe what people tell me that they see. Um, and I'm just going to, you know, just go down the road that I'm going and see what happens. Right. So um, is there any questions or anything up at this point? I don't have any at the moment. How about you, Grant? No, I'm just following the timeline here. Okay. Getting, uh, well, we're, getting, we're getting at... What's leading up to the book. Yeah. We're we're at a stopping point right here, so we're going to go ahead and go to intermission. And okay. Keith, we'll let you go get a drink of water and rest your throat. And know that okay. You know the allergies have been bad, so um, you're doing a fantastic job. Okay, and if we don't you. say very much, it's because we're just I, I'm completely involved in your storytelling. It is just wonderful. So we'll be back, everyone, and I don't know how many minutes that is, Brad. Yeah, it's, all, it's almost uh, nine minutes, about eight and a half minutes, oh. ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back in a few minutes. Order is good at this point. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty much following the same timeline that's in my book, too. Good. But it gets weirder. You are listening to Nightcallers Bigfoot Radio.
And now back to our game. Man, that Three Dog Night always reminds Love me of uh, Midnight Special, Wolfman Jack. <laughs> it reminds me host. of when we camped as kids. We used to walk around the campground, me and my sister singing that. We knew all the words. <laughs> Uh, hurts my brain. Hurts my brain. I don't want to remember back that far. I'm just glad I can remember back that far. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm glad to know that I'm here today where I can remember back that far. <laughs> yeah, wow. I didn't think I'd live this long. Oh, God. I know. We would have took better care of ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I remember the year 2000 was like, oh, my God, that's Star Trek world right there. There's no way I'm going to live that long. <laughs> well, we didn't know if we were going to live past 2000 anyway back then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like, remember, we thought it was going to be the end. That's what did it. they call mm-hmm. that? Uh, I can't even remember. It had a name. Uh Oh, wow. I can't remember either E2 or something you, uh, Y2K There oh, we go Y2K, Y2K yeah. that's what it was Y2K yeah. yeah Didn't think the computers People. would roll over And then yeah. it went At midnight on it, it, When it turned into 2000 Everything was just fine But everybody was holding their breath <laughs> yeah. Wow Hmm it's okay. Go I ahead, Brad. I'm still trying saying. to get these varmints back to the house. I guess they found the deer out there or something to chase, so. <clears throat> well, just don't walk into Bigfoot while you're out there. Ugh. Be nice. <laughs> so, Keith? Yes, sir. You started out getting to know some pretty controversial characters. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you realize the divide in the community. It's almost like Republican and Democrat. There's a great divide in the community about certain controversial aspects of those uh, people that you named off. Yes, sir. Uh, Melba and Arla and Tom and Ron is kind of on the fence with it. You were going to say something? Go ahead. No, I just said Autumn. Even Autumn's been controversial a lot. Yeah, I love well, Autumn. <laughs> well, I don't know where we're going with that, but I can just tell you, um, I disassociated myself with Melba after um, some things happened, and we all kind of know some things that went on along with mm. other people. Um, you know, there's always going to be controversy. Everybody thinks that their side is right or this is right or this is wrong. What I can tell you, it's what I know from my experience, and from my oh, experience, and from yeah. my experience, I can tell you with 100% certainty that Arla is phenomenal. She's, I call her my sister. We've gotten extremely close, and I can tell you some things that's happened, and I'll be more than willing to share them. Um, that would probably be. But would probably blow you away. Would probably go into another area. Um, but you know, I believe now, and as Ron Moorhead does, and several others, has been around the block for a while. That there's some there's some aspects to the Bigfoot people that's controversial. But it is what it is. What I'm going to share mm-hmm. with you is the absolute truth, the way I know it, and the way I've seen it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm no southern boy. I believe in telling the fellow the truth, and if you don't believe me, that's his problem. It's not my problem. So, <laughs> and that's what I'm, and that's what I'm going to do. Well, so, until yeah. people are able to get pictures and all this kind of stuff about their experience to back them up, it's 99 percent of Bigfoot is subjective. It is, and it always will be. That's why when I come right. on, I don't, I don't, I'll tell my story the way I see it. Do I have pictures of the Bigfoot? Nope, don't have one. I do have one pretty good game camera shot that's in my book uh, that was associated with a track that I think could be one, but it was extremely close to the camera and it's not definitive whatsoever. However, some of the people that you mentioned, 
has got some extremely good photos and even a video or two that's not shared. And the reason it's not shared is because it won't do any good anyway. Just like the past. I, yeah. Film, I don't care how good it is. It's not going to be good enough. There's always going to be controversy no matter what. So I've tried to keep my my association with the troublemakers, so to speak, and those that are out there to poke holes in everything without believing any anything else and calling people names, I try to disassociate myself with them because I'm not going to call anybody a name. I'm not negative. I try to be positive. And all I can tell you is the God's honest truth. Um, everything I'm telling you tonight, um, just like my grandfather always told me, son, you had better be able to, if you tell me something, state it on a stack of Bibles, and I will. It is what it is, and if you want to believe it, that's fine. If you don't, that's your prerogative. Um, but with that being said, uh, one of the things, we're going to go back a little bit, and then we'll get into some more. Uh, but after my wife's visual, one of the things that bugged me about the whole thing was I wanted her, and I told her, I said, well, why didn't you tell me when that was going on? She said, well, number one, I was afraid I was going to scare Lane, my grandson. If he would have turned around and saw what I saw, it would have scared him. He would have screamed and it would have scared my daughter. Mm -hmm. I said, was it scary to you? She said, no, it wasn't scary to me. But when it happened, it took me by complete shock. I didn't know what to do, what to say. All I knew was not to scare them. So she didn't say anything until they left. Because I sure wanted to be able to turn around and see it. I haven't seen one yet. And I've been, you know... Uh I've been doing a lot of work and trying to trying to get to where I could see, but it wasn't meant for me at that point in time, and that's what I've But she handled it the best way possible without causing right. a complete panic, yes. That's exactly right. But mm-hmm. what happened with her and the smile from him, she said she felt completely safe, and that was huge. It was huge for us. It was huge for me mentally. Um, it came to prove some of the things that I was so. Now, you got to remember, I'm taking everything Arliss told me, uh, Tom's told me, and I have used exactly what they said. And it worked. And I can also tell you that, and you'll hear it a little bit later, I've been in the woods at, with Arla and with a few others and seen for myself what happens and how she reacts and interacts with a Bigfoot. And it's beyond amazing. It's may I may I say dialogue. something real quick? Sure, sure. Um, I was on uh, Alex's show, and yeah. Arnold was, of course, the co-host at that time. And uh, yeah. and I told her, you know, I even though I've had several experiences, I was afraid of them, you yeah. know. And uh, she, you know tried her best to try to talk me out of the course. I, I I know that in the course of an hour show or however long it was that she did the best she could and that in order for her to convince me that I was safe, it would take a little bit more than right. she had time for. But right. I have the utmost respect for Arla. I have to say this because she is not a... Um, She's not looking for fame, nope. and she is all she is doing is trying to get everybody to be able to interact. That's correct. And and she's trying to break down the communication barrier between them and us. And and that's why I give her kudos because yep. she's doing something that not a lot of people are doing, and that you have been. Uh, basically mentored by her, I, yeah. I think that that's awesome. So I, I'm not not everybody is. Um, I know she's controversial and everything like that, but at the same time, I tend to be open minded. So I just wanted right. to say that, put that yeah. out there for you. So. Well, that's good because an open mind is the key to this whole thing. That and respect. exactly. And the one thing that she has taught me is as long as you have the respect, it's just like this. And this is a, I've used this example so many times. <clears throat> okay, you have a knock on your door. You go to your door one night. You uh, look out. You want to make sure that whoever 
that's standing out there don't look like they're going to rob you or whatever before you open the door. So if you look out and they look respectful and they're smiling, they look like problem, you may crack the door say, can I help you? Yes, this is so-and-so, I'm here, and I'm sure no, I'm explain, they're going to explain to you why they're visiting or what they're doing. So they're trying to show you respect for your house and for you enough to where you feel comfortable opening the door. So, and the same thing with a Bigfoot. If you go into their in their home or where they live, if you don't go in and respect them, if you don't go in gently and try to introduce yourself and show them that you are not here for any reason but, you know, to respect them, to respect their home, they're more likely to let you in and interact with you. Otherwise, you may not get anything or you may get shoot away. And that's mm-hmm. kind of the way I look at it. If you go blasting through their house with a gun and you go running through acting crazy like some in the community want to do and go out and shoot one, well, I'm sorry if uh, if you don't get any results. That's probably why. They're not going to show themselves. Or you may get something that that may hurt you. You know, if you go running into my house, I can guarantee I'm you I'm going to shoot you. You know, you're not going to be <laughs> welcome. I'm going to shoot you. And the mm-hmm. same with them. You wonder why some are aggressive. Well, that's probably the reason. So it mm-hmm. all has to do with respect. It, that's where it starts, and that's where it finishes. And that's that's the way I do it. You know, I I follow the examples that's been set before me, and I have nothing but great great things to say about my friends that I have picked that's around me now. We have a pretty good group. And speaking of of Alex McNutt Walker and, and the show. Uh, we're going to back up a little bit back to 2010 when he had uh, his conference here in Georgia. Um, or was it 2012? I may be and I'm not going back. I'm not going back to the right time period. 2000 to 2012, he had a uh, conference here in Georgia, and I had gotten to talking to him. And Arla was going to make the trip. I'd never met her before. Tom Cantrell was going to make the trip. Ron Moorhead was making the trip. Uh, Christopher Noel was making the trip. Um, there were several that were going to be there, and I was anxious to help Alex. And he, you know, asked me if I wanted to come along, and so I helped him with whatever needed to be done, just so I could be there and learn. And you know, I picked up Ron and Tom, my wife. Got, I picked up Arla from the airport, and we had a caravan coming, going up to Delonica where we stayed. And that trip from the airport to Delonica with Ron Moorhead and Tom Cantrell talking about Bigfoot was surreal to me. It was amazing, the conversation that I got to hear and the questions I got to ask Ron. And oh, I envy thing. you. I bet it was. Just, it was wow. It was fantastic. It was so fantastic that, and the ones that are listening to me out there, especially if it's Tom, he's laughing because <clears throat> I ended up going around Atlanta two times. I got lost in my own hometown and drove around for <laughs> Two extra hours to go to Delonica, and I told them that I made the wrong turn by mistake, but actually I was just wanting to hear more stories. <laughs> yeah, were you afraid that once you got back to camp, they'd get dispersed <laughs> and you wouldn't be privy? Yes. <laughs> but what a fantastic time that was for me. And um, we got up to Delonica, and that whole weekend was a magical weekend. And it wasn't just for the speakers. I got to meet all of the first for the first time in real life, and, uh, Ron Moorhead and share time sitting, and we all shared a house. We, you know, we had a house together, so we were able to, uh, or a cabin rather. Uh, so we were able to. Scott Nelson was with us, um, so we got to hear stories from Scott, and he does a really good uh, impersonation talking. He could sound just like like the Sierra sounds. It's pretty amazing to hear. So wow. you know, we got to you know experience all that. I'm getting to talk to these people and really start learning, and that's where my my learning jumped. Uh, tenfold, and to be able to talk to these people and, and make friends with them and understand and talk after we left, and I've had a pretty open line of communication from that point forward. Um, uh, was then I was on uh, the Bigfoot forums. I was an admin on there, um, and then I started doing some blog blogs for them, doing interviews. I did interviews with Scott um, Nelson, Ron Moorhead. Uh, Tom was gracious enough to do a, an interview with Bob Gimlin for me. Uh, through Tom um, and several others, and it's turned out pretty well. But I'm learning now just by leaps and bounds by talking to to these great people. Um, And I consider most all of them mentors at this point. 
So, mm-hmm. but I want to tell a story going back to that trip in Delonica that that's one of my favorites. I've got two actually kid stories that I, I want to throw in here because it kind of breaks up the monotony of thinking that they're monsters, especially when you see the the you know the interaction that was going on between kids and them. There was a uh, one evening that after the conference was over with, there's a great big hillside back in the edge of the forest, and myself, Alex, um, several others. I think Scott was with us at one point. I think Ron may have walked back there for a brief period. Uh, but there was a lot of kids and some adults that walked back on this great big hillside, and we're kind of back enjoying the night sounds, you know, listening to the crickets and the night sounds. And all of a sudden we, we see uh, – we see this bright light out in the woods, and Alex is pointing. He said, look at that. He said, look at that, and just keep keep your eyes on it. Well, it was two eyes, and they were shining just like two little flashlights. And he said, wow. that's, them. that's them looking at us. And I said, really? And you could hear them walking. You could hear movement back and forth. And this one little kid named Elijah, he's he's about eight or nine years old. And he's so fascinated by it, and he's all excited, and he's jumping up and down and talking to his mom. Look, mom, look, mom, and we're hearing all this noise and seeing things. And every, there's quite a few people that are witnessing it. We see two or three different sets of eyes looking off this hillside. Through that night and at the end of the conference, this little kid named Elijah, he was already so into this thing that he was sitting up on the front row every single day waiting to hear more and waiting to hear more. And so we got to talking to him after the conference, and and uh, I, I looked over, and he had a tear in his eye right after the last speaker. And I'm like, are you okay, Elijah? He said, I'm just sad that it's over with. He said, I wanted to hear more. He said, and I wanted to see a Bigfoot, and I'm not going to get to see a Bigfoot. He said, but I prayed last night that I'd be able to see uh, a Bigfoot or know that that was them on the hillside, and I don't, I haven't seen anything, so I don't know if that was them or not. And I'm like, well, you know, you can't expect that that's going to happen you know it's and i tried to you know calm him down there's a couple other people talking and he's he's actually he's got his tears rolling down his face and it was kind of cute and kind of sad at the same time but mm-hmm. we said our goodbyes and we started out um a couple of friends of mine were following us and we're leaving the area and i looked over my wife posted me on the side she said look over there and then i looked over and there was this little rock stack off the side of the road upon a little bank, and I'm looking at it, and we pull over, and I get the camera out, I take some photos, and all these are in my book, all the stuff that I'm telling you, all the pictures I'm talking about is in my book. So I see it, and it's a little rock stack, and it looks like a little human figure, or a little, like it has two legs, looks like a head, and maybe a couple of arms made out of rocks. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. We took pictures of it. I didn't know if somebody made it or if they made it or what, it's, it, but it was pretty cool mm-hmm. to see, so we took photos and we went home. Well, that night on Facebook, um, I got with Elijah's mom, and she said, did you see that rock stack that looked like a human on the side of it? I said, yes, ma'am, we did. We actually took some photos of it, and I sent them over to her. And she says, well, I want to tell you, when Elijah seen that rock stack, he burst out in laughter and said, I knew it. I knew they were real. They showed me. They showed me a sign. I knew they were real. So whether it was them or uh, not, it was still confirmation to him. And it really mm-hmm. it was a good feeling, you know. It was a really good feeling to see that. It's one of my favorite stories of the conference, and I don't even know if they did it or not, but it was cool. <laughs> That's <clears throat> awesome. But, but another, uh, another story I wanted to share with you before I get past it, because th- this, this is a big deal, too. After, um, after Arla was telling me, you know, certain things, and we're talking about having the Georgia camp out now. We're winding down our, our season, this turkey season, and I took uh, one of my wife's other grandkids, Hunter, down with us. And um, I had some apples. I had seven apples in a bag, and I've never gifted food except for the watermelons. So what I wanted to try these apples, because I read about the people putting things out, and, that, and Hunter was with me. We were going to just try a little experiment. So I, we got on the four-wheeler, and I drove over to the place that I told you had the tree that was bent over with the logs on top of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was a there was another tree beside it was bent over in a perfect arch, um, but it was a wider tree, and it was a it was a gradual arch, and it wasn't like real high. Um, and I told Hunter, I said, "Can you balance those rocks on top of this arch right here, or not rocks? Those apples on top of this uh, arch right here." So he's putting the things up there, and he gets five of them up on there, and they all stayed. 
But the sixth one kept rolling off. He couldn't make it stay. And I told him, I said, look, here's what, what we'll do. He said, uh, I told him, take those other ones and just put them on that stump over there. You've got a couple left. Uh, we'll just leave the five up here. We'll put those two on the stump over here beside it. We'll just come back in the morning and check them. So we did that. I took photos of the apples. We went back to camp. We went to the camper and had dinner and, uh, and all that, went to bed. And the next morning, I decided before he even woke up, I was going to ease over there. It wasn't too far from camp just to check and see if they were still there. And uh, I go over there, and I see the stump immediately only has one apple on it, and there were two. So my thoughts was, oh, if a deer come by or a raccoon or whatever took the apple, was it not, not a big deal? I didn't think it was on you know, the big foot or whatever. Until I looked at the tree where he had the five apples, now there were six. There were six apples on the tree. There was only five when we left. One of the ones on the stump ended up on the tree when we left. <laughs> I don't know of any so, wildlife that does that. No. I really don't. <laughs> so, again, that's confirmation, but it was more than that. It was confirmation that they saw him trying to get that apple up there, and he couldn't mm-hmm. do it. So they ended up uh, putting the apple on the tree. So, you know, when I go back to camp, I, I get get Hunter and we go back up. I told him what happened. I took some photos, and it's in, it's in the book, too. But, yeah, that was that was another one of those moments that um, was confirmation and reaffirmation. So another one that kept, it helped shape my thoughts about the Bigfoot being a people. So you know, that's, before, uh, you, before you go on, uh, Brad? Has there been any questions in the chat? I just wanted to make sure. I haven't seen anybody posting anything, no. Okay, Um, okay. That would be a no. Lauren says no. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, carry on, Keith. You're doing a marvelous job. All right. (laughs) Well, it's getting a little late, so if I start stumbling my words a bit, I'll... uh, I needed another cup of coffee for a while, but I think I can make it. Um, so we, we're down now to getting closer to when we decide we're going to start having the camp house in Georgia. And after that fantastic weekend we had in Dahlonega and got to meet all those cool people and hang out, um, I even more want to get together and bring Arla here and let her actually go out with me. I'm, I'm anxious to see what I've heard, you know, and let her show me more of what I've been hearing from her. So what we decided to do is Kathy and I went out one one nice evening and took a drive out to there. It's only an hour from my house. It's not that far from where I live. Um, and there was an, uh, an old Indian reservation that's called uh, – it's in Carrollton. And I, and I don't want to give the name out, but that Indian reservation was one of the areas that I thought about. And I thought, well, you know, that'd be cool to go out and uh, and and look at the history. I, I'm into history anyway, so we go and we find this area, and we decide we're gonna go in and take a look around. And as soon as we pull into the into the area, I hear um, I hear some noises out in the woods. You know, I'm thinking there's somebody walking through the woods. There's a lot of horses around that, so it's not a big deal. But I I catch uh, a whiff of this really bad smell. It was was very strong. It smelled like rotted flesh or some kind of decomposed trash. So I'm telling my wife, I said, dude, something's bad in that trash can there. So I went over to look just to see what was in there. And there was nothing in there. It had been changed. It was just a clean bag. And I looked in the other one. There was another one not too far away, same thing. So and I'm thinking, could that be Bigfoot? You know, I've heard that they make a smell. I've never smelled it before up until that point. And the Wind was blowing a little bit in my face from the tree line, and the tree line was where I kept hearing the you know, moving around and the sticks and that breaking. Um, and it was coming from that area, so I'm thinking, well, whatever it is, it smells really bad. So uh, we decided we're going to go on a little walk and look around the area a bit. So we, we found a trail. We went um, up a little hill, and as we're walking, the the wind is blowing from my right to my left, from below us, there's another trail that runs parallel parallel with the trail that we're on on top of the ridge, and the smell is coming from that bottom side of that trail. And if you're a hunter, and I grew up hunting, when you're deer hunting, you always keep the wind in your face. You don't want, you know, to get downwind of your prey or whatever. So, I was real familiar with where the where the 
smell was coming from. It was hitting me from the right side. So I turned around a couple of times and tried to look down the trail. There was just too many trees. I couldn't see that bottom trail, but I could sure smell it. So we walk on down the ridge a little bit, and we find the, we find this two trees that are on the trail forming a perfect X. I mean, it's it's huge. It's probably 12 feet high, uh, and it's shaped like a big X. And I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, well, that's really cool. So I took some photos. Those photos are in the book. Went on down, and I found some arches, really good arches. Um, one was curved all the way around and, and jabbed back down into the ground to so the top of the tree, and had been there for quite a while. It was growing that way now. And uh, about that time we're looking at this tree, I hear a really awful noise of, of uh, something panic running running at us full blaze, and I'm thinking, well, something's scared. It's coming up this hill. I didn't know what was about to show up, and a deer come bounding out and almost run over me and my wife from the bottom. Something had scared it so bad. So it runs on across the trail, and I keep smelling that smell, and I told her, I said, I think that deer was spooked by something on that trail. So it was starting to get a little late, and I wanted to go down and look at that trail and see if there was anything that I could see, if there was any footprints or notice anything. So we go back out of the woods. We go back down that trail where we kept smelling the smell, and we ran across the perfect footprints in the sand. I mean, they were just perfect, and they're, all those photos are in the book as well. i seen some wow. big tracks that were like 14, 16 inches long, some that weren't quite as long as that. And then there were some little small ones that were only like three inches long, little bitty baby tracks. And I told my wife, I said, could the babies be walking? Is this a Bigfoot baby track? And she's on and oohing over the little tracks. So we're trying to take pictures of those too. Um, but these tracks are, are amazing tracks. I mean, they really are. They're some of the best I've seen. So we get those photos, and I go back. Uh, we go back to the truck. It's starting to get dark. And, uh, what about call the smell? Does call it go away? The smell, ma'am. Oh yeah, the Did smell. Did you smell after, the smell? After we the deer ran across the trail, I never smelled the smell again. When we went back out okay. the trail, I never smelled it anymore the whole time we were there. And when we went back down that trail, I couldn't smell it either. And I've only wow. smelled that smell one other time, and that was this last October when I went down to the same area where we're having the campouts. So anyway, okay. um. So we go back, I, I, we get in the car, and we get into, I mean, we don't have a lot of signal there, so we finally get an area that we have pretty good signal, and I call Arla, and I told her about, I think I found the place that we're going to do it. They had campsites and that. There's a couple other camping areas that are not too far away. Uh, so we decide we're going to start having the campouts in, the, in this general location. Um, so we get everything set up. And we've been having the campouts there now for this is uh, this is our fourth year. Uh, we just actually had one this spring, uh, well actually last week, and we have another one coming up in October. But uh, and those have led to some life changing experiences, and we will get into the who's next. Um, yeah. So after that, and we start making the plans uh, again. I'm I'm on. Facebook and I'm on the internet and I've got all these different sites and I'm going through and looking at it. I had the good fortune to meet Bob Gimlin last year when I spoke at a, a conference up in uh, in Washington um, for Matt Johnson and his group had a, a conference I spoke there. Uh, so I'm starting to meet all these people to me that I thought were just like superstars in the Bigfoot world but when you get to know them, especially Bob Gimlin some of the nicest people I've ever met so during my learning process, I've ran across some of the best people in the world and, and to this day are some of my very best friends. But then on the other hand, <laughs> I ran across people that are completely the opposite, uh, people that want to tear you down, call you names, call you a liar, call you this or that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't understand exactly where the anger comes in. It's just so emotional for some people. Um, yes. You either fall into this camp or you fall into that camp, and if you fall into the wrong <laughs> one, you get people mad at you. Now, all I know is what I'm experiencing, and all I know is what I can tell you that's happened to me. I share it graciously and, and will tell anybody my story. Um, if they start 
call me a liar and that, that's good too. I've learned just to turn my back and walk away because what's happened's happened. I know what's happened. They're not taking that away from me. Mm-hmm. Well, like I've so, said on several shows, it's just a hobby. And right. some people take it so damn serious. They they have a tendency to let their personalities get away from them. If they're if they're you know cutting you down, they're probably cutting some other people down in other in real life outside of Bigfoot. Right. So right. it's just their basic personalities, and you have to just write them off. I mean, it's not like they That's have right. a following or anything. It's, and it's, it's just like it's in, almost uh, like uh, I was just kind of saying, it's kind of like religion. Some people are really believe a certain way, they believe God's a certain way, Jesus is a certain way and and they they get kind of bent if somebody has a different view of it. And they right. know what they know. And everyone knows what they know. So it's kind of yeah, you know, one politics. thing we no, find no, out no, having no. this show. Yeah, we have a lot of different views on this show and uh but I think it's fair to hear out everybody. Right. So, well, you, just like I told you guys from the very beginning, the job that I had for 24 years with the company I was at uh, was based in, and I, it's a science. Uh, you, you have to research, you gather information, you gather facts, um, you try to develop a root cause, and you try to uh, develop a you know a solution to the problem at the end of the whole at the whole thing, and that's kind of the way this thing has been for me. I've I've learned to be open minded. Uh, I wasn't as much open-minded when I started, but now I have learned to be totally open-minded and listen to everybody's theory because some people have theories based on facts. Some are based off of what other people have told them or what they've learned. I try to uh, myself align with the people that are actually experiencing the things that, that they're telling me about. And if I can, I want to get to know them and I want if I can even bring them out with me and and, and share some time in the woods. I want to see what what they what they know. I, I want to share with them what I know, <clears throat> and it's really blossomed into some cool friendships with some great great researchers and great people. And uh, so, you know, that's what this thing is that that Arla has started with the campouts coming to Georgia, and you know, I help her get them together, and we invite uh, a few people to come out and spend some time. And it's not about anything but sharing information. Yep, we're in an area that there's Bigfoot activity. If people experience them, great. But if not, they're going to get to hear a lot of really cool things and learn a lot of really, uh, in my opinion, information that can change your life. And it has changed lives. It's changed a few, and I'll get into some of those and some of those experiences. Okay, because you've got about... You've got about 18 minutes left, so you... Okay. Well, let me get there to those to those stories, because this is where it all really jumps off the, the charts for me. So we start okay. having the campouts, and we do night walks quite a bit. Uh, one of the night walks that, uh, that I've started doing in a certain area, I've always got activity. When we go in to this area, we wait till it gets dark. We start in. Uh, there's audible uh, sounds of footsteps in the leaves that will follow us in, a one on either side of the trail, uh, spaced out about 100 yards apart. So they pick us up, and this happens every single time I go in there. And you can, if you've you got take a, flashlights? A, we take flashlights, but I aim them straight down only to find where the rocks okay. are in the trail so we don't fall. And we turn the flashlights out every so many feet and just stand there. I try not okay. to shine the lights around in the woods. So that's, that's what I started doing. Yep. Yeah. We've had some really good, uh, and I'm going to say it right here now, eye shine. It's nothing uh-huh. uh, reflecting. It's eye shine. It's like independent of any light source. That's exactly right. Because there was one evening. I've seen it, it too. Dark. I believe you. So, yes, I've seen ma'am. it too. So, so those are some of the things we started seeing. Now, after our first camp out, we had uh, we had quite a few things go on. And this one time in particular, we're all around the campfire. It's almost dusky dark. Uh, Tom Cantrell's there. Arlo's there. There's several others, uh, several pretty good researchers that you'd know. Um, But I'm not going to give out any names unless I've asked them first. So we're sitting there by the fire, and we have two girls that come into camp that have never seen a Bigfoot. They're there trying to learn and experience things. All of a sudden, one starts yelling, oh, my God, we've got company. Look, turn around. And the other girl with her, she grabs her mouth, and she's pointing, and 
We turn around behind us. Now, I can't see what's going on, but I do see movement. She said he was standing right there. He came right into the campfire. He was standing right there, and they both saw him. The first uh, visuals these girls had ever had. So Arla stands up. I stand up behind Arla. She starts through the woods, and I'm like, I'm not going to miss this. i got to go. So I'm walking behind <laughs> her. So I'm walking behind her. It's like I said, it's, it's not completely dark. You can see where you're going. I walk out, and Arla's talking to them like they're kids. Hey there, it's me. It's Arla, blah, blah, blah. And she's talking, and I'm amazed at how gentle her voice is. And she says, Keith, come here. And I walk up. She said, look, there's one standing right here. I look over, and there is a leg and a shoulder behind a tree, and I could see them. I mean, they were plain as day. And I'm looking, and I'm amazed. I can't see the head. I can only see uh-huh. a little bit of the of the black up the side of where the tree was. He was behind the tree, and there was a little one that was shooting in and out of his legs and running behind the little bushes. He was only like three foot tall, and I'm completely oh my God. Uh, yeah, I'm completely speechless at this point. I've never seen them before like this. So uh-huh. this is taking me back. When I hear a noise, I turn around. I'm thinking there's one behind me. It's another little little guy. Uh, was camping with us. He's 11 years old, named Zach. Zach comes in. He says, are you really seeing him? Are you really seeing him? So he looks over, and he catches the little one, and it's moving back and forth. He said, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So he's seeing I'm standing there. Arla's pointing at him and she, or telling us, look this way. And I'm looking at it, and this is all happening right in front of us. And there was a couple other people that joined us later. Uh, and we can see them move, and it's starting to get a little darker. We can start seeing them move between two trees. You'd see the whole area just turn dark. You can see them move behind another uh-huh. tree. So we're watching all this, and this is over a course of probably 45 minutes, and I'm just totally blown away. I've never had anything I'm like this. I imagine you are. <laughs> I was completely in shock and in awe of what, what was going on. So I'm I'm stoked at this point. I when I get uh, When I get back to camp, it's all I can – think about i'm shaking i'm so excited about what's happened i just couldn't believe it so and arla acts like nothing ever happened she's as calm as she can be and we go and sit back down uh so uh, that was my first experience with her and i was so amazed at how she talked to them and how they seemed to react and stay calm it was it was absolutely amazing so um we didn't have a whole lot more happen that weekend um, but I will tell you, on Paso weekend, a few weeks down the road, um, we get into wintertime, and I start talking to Arla even more, and we strike a really great uh, friendship from that point. And I, I feel like she's my sister, and I talk to her every single day. This lady is who she is, says she is. She's, she is a gentle person. She's as honest as the day is long. I've seen what she's seen in the last few years. I've, she's shared pictures of some of hers with me. And it's simply amazing. So um, we are having the camp out. The very next spring, um, I have a couple of people uh, that want to go out without all the crowd of our camp outs and you just go back out there and see if they can see. So I have these four, these four guys, and I uh, agree to meet them out in, in May. We, we pull into the campsite where we were. It's just us. And they want to go on a night walk. Well, now this is where I'm going to tell you that this is exact the truth, the way it happened, and this is going to tell you a little bit more about Arla. Arla uh, has been known to be able to tell things are going to happen before they happen, and it's absolutely the truth. Uh-huh. And I can share something that happened with my mom that will blow you away if we have time, but I don't know if we will. But anyway, Arla, I had asked her, uh, she has what she calls a teacher, that a Bigfoot that, that she – was able to communicate with it. And I asked her, I said, am I ever going to have a teacher like that? That's cool. And she said, yeah, you are. And I was like, what? She said, yeah. Uh, And she told me, she said, Keith, you're going to find him, and he's going to show himself to you in the place of the great learning tree. And I said, well, what is that? She said, well, I can see, I can hear a loud boom, I can see fire. She said, the only thing I can describe it as like a thunder, you know, a lightning strike, a thunder on a hill. And she said, I see a tree. And so it's a place the Bigfoot come to to gather, and the leader there, the clan leader, teaches the Bigfoot. And I'm like, okay. So I'll follow all this <laughs> down in my mind, and I said, okay. 
So I'm going out here with these guys in a couple weeks, and I tell one of the gentlemen with me, I said, let me tell you what Arla told me. She told me I was going to meet a teacher. Now, she's told me everything that's going to happen before, you know, different things that would happen if I did this or did that. It all happened, but this was a stretch for even me at this point. But I believed her. I told them. I said, this is what she said. Okay, we go back in the woods uh, to the walking alongside of us. We go back um, down the trail, and we get to an area, and we see this bright light on top of the hill. And I'm immediately thinking it's a flashlight. So I look up the hill, and this flashlight that's coming down this hill turns into two eyes. And those eyes, are they're shining in front of them. And I could see, and you could hear them walking down the hill. He comes down yeah. the hill, he stops 20 feet in front of us along a creek bed, and he's looking over and under a limb. You can see his eyes go up, you can see him blinking, his eyes go up under the limb, and he's just bobbing back and forth. And we're looking at it, and he's very close, I mean very close, and he's huge. You could tell how big he was because of his eyes and where he was standing in relation to this tree. And the next day, one of the guys goes out and measures his limb, and it was 10 and a half feet. He was looking over the limb. So anyway. Yeah. As we're standing there looking at this, uh, one of the guys decides he's going to do what they call a greeting grunt. He does this grunt sound. And when he does, his eyes went from that white, bluish, white, yellow color to a bright, deep red. I mean, almost immediately, like two brake lights on a car. And it scared us all because, I mean, I felt fear when I seen the, the eyes turn this red color. And so mm-hmm. I apologized quickly. I said, I'm sorry that that happened. I'm sorry that that happened. So we apologize. His eyes go back to white. He turns. He walks off, and I never see him again. When he turned to walk away and his eyes got out of sight, you could hear him walking, but you couldn't see him. I couldn't see anything. So he leaves. The next day, um, and we all go home for the night. I go home. They camp there because I don't live that far away, and I wasn't camping there that night. So uh, one of the guys, I started to say his name. I probably couldn't. He wouldn't get mad, but I, I told him I wouldn't tell their names on, on the air. He goes back over the next day, and he measures that limb at uh, 10 and a half feet. Well, a little bit later down the road, uh, we go back over there, and, and he's actually found on top of the hill that he came down. He goes up on top of the hill, and took me. He said, you got to come over and see this, Keith. So me and him and three others go up on top of the hill, and on top of the hill, what we found was a huge uh, stump that was burned there was a tree that had been struck by lightning and was laying in the in the woods uh, on top of the hill, and there was another stump beside it that was burned where another tree was. It was a lot older and had already rotted out partially. Um, and then there were uh, trees that were uh, that were aligned on top of that hill in a circle. Was, they looked just like benches, like you'd pull them up and you would set them like you were going to set people around on benches to watch an event. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what was on top of that hill. Blew me away. That's exactly like what Arla described. Exactly what she described. And not only did I see it, I've got four other people that were there. They all witnessed exactly the same thing. And now that we've had the camp out, there's been even more people that's been able to go out and see those things. Um, how much time do we have? Because i got a little bit more I need to get to. Okay. What is it, six minutes? Mm-hmm. Six minutes. Okay. Right. In the, the next couple of years, the campouts have gotten better. Um, we've had people that have had experiences, had visuals. Uh, there was one lady that's uh, in the SEER group, the Colorado group, that came out, flew out, and was with us. Uh, her and another lady was walking across the field um, in the middle of the day. This is like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm in camp, and I see them coming across the field. But I look behind them, and I see something black. At first, I thought it was a, a black Labrador that somebody had running through the woods. But mm-hmm. then as it came out into the field, it was a Bigfoot right in the open in the clear of day. And he was behind them about 30 or 40 yards. They would walk by a group of trees, and he would run behind the trees, and he would peek around the trees at them. And I watched them come across the field, and I'm watching this, this guy. And then he shoots and goes back into the woods for that. When they come back up, I said, did you guys have anybody – following you did you see anything she said yeah there was this uh black bigfoot looking thing behind us two or three times i turned and i catch glimpses and you could hear him walking so we just kept walking through the woods and he followed us all the way out and i said yeah i just saw him 
he just ran back into the woods, and I'd tell her, tell you her name, and you would know her. Um, but yeah, I saw that with my own two eyes. And um, as of this date, we've had um, probably 80, 90 people at our campouts. And I'd say of uh, that many people, almost everyone's had an experience. They come into the camps at night. They walk around the tents. We've had them peeking in the tents at night. A few have seen them do that. Um, and we've had, we've had them. You would uh, think with all those people that would not be possible. It's amazing. <laughs> That's what I would think, too. Um, but the Bigfoot know where they're at. They're safe. They're in a park that's protected. And they have no mm-hmm. qualms about coming around people. And when we go there, we're in total respect, and we tell them that. Uh, we mm-hmm. camp out. Uh, we have the fire. We're very respectful of them. We tell them that. Um, one of the guys, um, and I'll tell you his name. I know he don't care, Alex Midnight Walker. Um, yeah. He was camping out and got out to relieve himself one night and started doing his business, and there was one, he said, I looked over, I seen something black, looked like an outline um, of a person laying on the ground, but it was just dark, it was just black. He said, I was looking at it, and I was doing my thing, and he said, this thing jumped up and started crawling away. He said, like an army crawl. And he said, yeah. are you kidding me? And he saw it, and he was telling the story. He said, I almost peed on one. So, you know, he's telling that story, and there's just so many others of people that, that come in their camp. There's was one gentleman who came out. Um, his brother had come to the camp out the year before, and his brother uh, and the kid, Zach, that was, was with us, he actually uh, was the one that was behind me when we seen the ones in the woods. Um, he said that he came out to see what his brother was experiencing, and he didn't really believe them that you know, that they were seeing all that he said. They wanted to experience what they were experiencing to see what it was. This guy's a pretty prominent guy. He's a judge. Uh, and he, I took him out with me because we had heard some things around our camp, you know, breaking sticks and that. And I gave him the parabolic, and we actually walked into a group of a family of them. We had three little ones peeking over a bush, and he was aiming the parabolic, and I was pointing to him. He was able to see them and hear them with a parabolic, and there was a mother that was just in front of them over to our right. She kept looking around a tree, and I'm looking at them. Arlo's with us again at this point, and another lady's behind us, and Scott is witnessing all this as it's happening. And then the next night, we go, and this is leading up to this point, uh, we go to that very same area where um, we've seen the eye shine come from the hill. And Scott's with us. Um, there's a couple others that's with us. Arnold's with me. My wife's with me. And I, I, we, we go down the hill um, and up by the, the creek there and on the trail. And I notice the eyes up on top of the hill. This time it's coming from our right instead of from our left. It's walking down the hill. And I point out to Arnold. I said, look, he's coming down the hill. She said, I can see him. He gets down in the trail. And we do have a little moonlight this night. It's not real bright, but it's. It's shining enough to where you can see a little bit. The trail is white sand, okay? When he got down in the trail, his entire see how high he was. He's extremely tall, and he's standing there looking at us, and he's like 30 feet away. And I can make out the entire form, and Arlo and I walked up close. She said, you need to walk closer. So I walked a little bit closer, and he's standing there looking at me. He makes a step or two toward me, and I'm looking at him, and... I get this shot of electricity that goes through my body. Um, my head starts hurting really, really bad. Um, I get these sensations in my head. I'm seeing things in front of my eyes. It's like I don't know what's going on. It's like I walked into a completely different environment, uh, and I'm I'm totally out of sorts. This goes on for a little bit. I can't take it anymore. I backed up, and I said, I don't know what happened. And she said, well, just, you know, just try, try to take it easy. Just let it soak in. And I did. I, I walked back to the group because I didn't want to have any more of those pains going through my head. And my wife wanted to walk forward, so she did. So she goes up, and he's still standing there. And I'm watching her, and she's looking at him, and her left leg starts coming up off the ground. And she had had a very bad car wreck, so she's got a lot of metal in her leg. And that leg that she had had the wreck in is actually – being drawn t- toward him like there's a surge of electricity. It's like a magnet or something. 
Mm-hmm. And like I said, I don't know what's going on. All I could feel was electricity in the air. There was a huge amount of energy associated with it. Um, after it was over with and we left, I was so drained. I couldn't even wake up the next day. And I, we went home. We I, I went home to stay. I couldn't stay there. And I was completely drained of energy. And this happened uh, that night. And there was people with me that saw it. I mean, Arnold was there. There were several others. Well, the, the one guy that was a judge ends up going home, and it so deeply affected him. He had to take time off work uh, to, to ah. get his bearings, to get come to grips with what he had witnessed and what he had seen and what he experienced. Um, <clears throat> those are just a couple of the things. There's so many more, and it's all I in the I so book. wish we had more time because we've yep. completely run out of time. But right. I, I have experienced some of the things you're talking about, and I guess I'm just going to have to write your phone number down and call you. <laughs> yep. We need to talk some more because um, it's we been sure a lot do. And we'd lo- We would love to have you back because I think you have a whole lot more to say. <laughs> a whole lot more there's, to say. There's a lot more stories. That's It's an ongoing thing. And the, and the good thing is, um, you know, I'm continuing to experience these things and, and – I get to share it with other people, and that's the really cool part, Laurie. It's not that I'm going out and seeing things and experiencing them by myself, and I come back and tell people. There's people with me, and they can all verify, verify. exactly what's happened. You can talk to them. They'll tell you the stories. You know, They'll tell you the things, and they all jive. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's the cool aspect, and that's the good thing about the campouts and the things that we're having. We're able to share, and um, and everybody gets, you know, gets their part of it. They get to to share in it and understand and learn. Well, Keith, you've been an excellent guest. Gary, I I just, I want to plug your book real quick and also the museum, the Georgia Museum. Uh, Those are going to be on the Bigfoot website, I mean, on the Night Callers um, show page and also on our Night Callers Facebook are the links to the Georgia Museum. Yep. Which you didn't really have a chance to even talk about him, did you? I so did. We were running everybody, up. yeah, everybody needs to go visit Dave Bacara. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent museum. And he's got some wonderful people that's coming through there telling stories of the area. And to find your book is on Amazon? That's right. Amazon.com, okay. or you can get with me on Facebook. I can point you in the direction. Um, but yeah, okay. just go on Amazon.com. Uh, look up Forest Friends of the Night, and you should be able to find it. Okay. Well, everyone, we will be back on, I think it's the 21st. Let me make sure before I let everyone go tonight. Let's see. Yes, we'll be back on the 21st. So everyone have a nice couple of weeks off. I'm going to be a married woman when we get back. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And, uh, we'll make you a legal tell everyone. Yes. Everyone say good night. Good night. Okay, good night, good night now. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>